12 years ago, the world was blessed with Victoria 2. It has remained one of Paradox's most positively reviewed grand strategy games. And now we have Victoria 3, which promises to give us the opportunity to shape a grand tomorrow. And the question is, does it deliver? Initial look at Steam reviews suggests perhaps it doesn't. Around 63% positive at the time of recording leaves them mixed. Uh, critic reviews are expectedly somewhat higher, but even if you average them out, we're looking at about a 7 out of 10. Reviewers are inflamed, passionately so, even with just 1.5 hours on record. And of course, there are others who share more of a positive view on Victoria 3. I've had an opportunity now not just to take a look at an early press preview build, but get my meaty little grubby hands on it myself. And in this video, I want to deliver, as you can tell by the title, my own opinion on the Victoria 3 controversy to help you maybe make a purchasing decision if you're wanting to buy it, but more broadly, actually discuss how it fits within the strategy game genre. Should you play it? Is it worth it? Let's discuss its problems, the things it might need to work on, and finally, my own opinion. And reflecting back on my review, would I recommend it to someone like you? Victoria 3 absolutely has its quirks, like a lot of other Paradox games, although of course not to the extent of something like Crusader Kings 3. And as I mentioned at the start, it's coming in 12 years after Victoria 2. Not only does that mean it could be a vital refresh for the engine or compatibility with modern systems, but it also probably means that there's a little bit more to do. It is, after all, competing with a fully-fledged Victoria 2. And I think when we reflect on reviews, that criticism comes through. But also, there are other criticisms outside of that. Whether you think it's a bias, people who have played a lot of Victoria 2 and expect 3 to be that way, or whether you consider the criticism to be fair, levied, and generally well-placed, Victoria 3 does have things it needs to address, or in my opinion, at least some problems it should iron out. The significance of them is maybe more up to you than me. But as I tab through my government here, looking through different laws on what to establish in the Japanese shogunate, it reminds me of the first problem, and that is that it can be a little bit tabzilla up in here. Like when you've had Chrome open for far too long on your desktop and you come back and not only is it eating all of your RAM, but why is that tab still there? I thought I closed that one and oh geez, that one wasn't even moving along. It can be a little bit overwhelming. And this is, I think, especially true where there are tabs that do the same thing. Here I'm looking at the lenses down the bottom and the tabs along the left-hand side of the screen where I'm looking at things like buildings and clothing, manufacturing, that, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, we have tabs here that are doing the exact same thing. They're open at the exact same time. They don't cancel each other out. There are loads of, I think, things that could be ironed out here in this UI to just streamline it a bit more. It is almost to the point where even as a somewhat experienced player, I find I just occasionally lose a little bit of time fiddling around through the menus because I have too many open at once. Is this a deal breaker? Absolutely not. Don't take me the wrong way here. I don't feel especially inflamed about this one. But I do think that there's some work to do to fix that UI tabbage issue because it can get a little overwhelming. There's also an accessibility issue here to consider. I myself don't have many accessibility issues when it comes to playing video games or experiencing the computer in general. If you do, I'd love to hear from you about how this UI works for you. Please do let me know. I'm sure there'll be plenty of discussion in the comments. Let's try and keep it civil. Uh, you can also reach out to me on Twitter if you like. The repetition is a shame because some of the systems and overlays are really good and really clean. The diplomatic overlay, for example, of the map is fantastic. There are others that do their job really well, but they get a little bit lost in the tabbage, if that's a word, uh, in the detail more broadly. The next thing, and it, it sort of slides along from that one quite nicely, is that, and this one is a big one, that the war system is too hands-off, that the only way to really manage it is through those tabs, by building barracks, upgrading the equipment, we'll talk about equipment in a minute, don't you worry, uh, and maybe structuring your government around it a little bit, passing certain laws, legislation, that kind of thing, yawn, but very powerful. Ultimately though, by the time you've recruited your generals, 
and assigned them to the front line if you even want to go that far after mobilizing them, the war is fairly hands off. Now, like I mentioned, you do mobilize generals and you can absolutely assign your battalions to different front lines and assign them to either attack, defend, or wait. And that is it. Personally, I actually don't really have an issue for it, particularly considering that this is as much, if not more so, an economic and political simulator. But I'm also not walking around with my head in the clouds. Military, militarism, combat, warfare is inevitably going to be a big part of this game too, even if we're uh, framing it under the guise of it being a diplomatic action, which I think also, by the way, credit where credit's due, the diplomatic action system is, generally speaking, a pleasure to use, at least in my opinion. However, the significance of warfare shouldn't be understated, and it is absolutely more hands-off than other paradox games. And I mention this in particular because I think it's natural that people will want to compare this to other paradox games. Of course, the comparison to Victoria 2, the one that I drew right at the start of this video, will naturally frame the setting for Victoria 3, rightly or wrongly, but also, you know, we can reflect on those oddities like character creations and more broadly, the UI that has clearly been brought forward and through at least to match that of Crusader Kings 3. This is the more modern Victoria Crusader Kings maybe even Paradox Interactive look, engine, system, and style. I think we can probably expect that, and they've kind of talked about that a little bit in some of their developer Q&As and that kind of thing that we've covered and followed a little bit here on this channel. So do I have an issue with the war system? Personally not, no. Although, if I could choose, I would prefer it took on just a little bit more than Hearts of Iron 4 brings, or perhaps bring through a little bit of what Victoria 2 had offered that it doesn't yet. The reason why I add the yet is because many people speculate that further additions to the war, or, or combat system more broadly, will come to Victoria 3 through DLC. We don't have any official announcements on that, at least not to my knowledge. It would seem a little premature <laughs> for those to be made. But I don't think, actually, that it's an unreasonable guess. In fact, my money would be on that those people are probably right, just from looking back through the history of Paradox's development and the post-development cycle that they give for their games. There's usually a mixture of flavor packs and expansion packs, and they continue for years to come. Stellaris, Hearts of Iron 4, EU4, Crusader Kings... Need I say any more? If you're familiar with those franchises, then you'll be familiar with the fact that Paradox does like to produce a lot of DLC. And I don't think it'd be unreasonable to think that some of it will be in war for Vic 3. I think you're probably right, honestly, on that one. And it's probably not necessarily a bad thing. Of course, remembering that it will have to somewhat at least fit in with the design mantra of Victoria 3 whether it's the same or differs from Victoria 2, and that's been pretty clearly articulated to us that Victoria 3 is a political and economic simulator by design, that's the way it was intended, and warfare is one of the diplomatic play options. One very significant one, of course. Speaking of that design philosophy, that's another thing that has drawn criticism from the many people who have criticized Victoria 3 since launch, including those reviewers that we looked at at the start of this video. And that is that while on the one hand it claims to sort of provide this ability for us to lead from the very top, right? We're really managing an economy and a political system right from the top. But then there are also instances like this where we're getting right into the detail naval bases where we're choosing production methods, uh, administrative centers where we choose what kind of filing systems they'd like to use, and maybe if they're lucky, upgrade them to some filing cabinets. Uh, of course, I understand that that is somewhat necessary or required, perhaps to add a little bit of extra depth to the game. Not only do you just click a building and click to build it, but then within that, there are sort of three or four dimensions that you can fine tune. And it's important to note, of course, that those dimensions change other things. It's not just the productivity of the building. Uh, you can change, literally control over the building or choose the kind of populations that receive its profits. So by changing production methods or 
maybe shifting something from being state owned to owned by the church, you can actually have significant impacts on other parts of Victoria 3's system. So to simply label those things as a, a little bit micromanagey and therefore not aligned with what Vic's doing is, I think, fair, but also just a slight simplification that there are nuances within that that are still operating, right? You can influence, for example, politics and interest groups and therefore your populations and who they align with through that system. So it's not all bad, but the point does have to be taken that if we're going to keep that as our design philosophy that we're leading from the top, that must run through. And therefore, one of the common criticisms or opportunities here is that there needs to be to a certain extent, a little bit more automation with some of the nitty gritty detail. Some of those production method on buildings, for example, could use with at least an optional system whereby players can choose to automate that and maybe focus their attention on other things. Would it have to be used? Eh, not necessarily, but it could be. And I think that would go a long way to helping to lift up and at least provide some consistency in the way that we play Victoria 3, and kind of what hat we're wearing. Am I a worker managing a lumber yard, or am I somewhere above the emperor managing this simulator? It can at times be a little bit unclear. And while that personally doesn't take away too much from the gameplay for me, it can get a little bit frustrating, particularly where you're trying to bring in efficiencies or really do the best that you can. If you're trying to min-max this completely and fully, you're likely going to be a little frustrated with that. Absolutely. One of the overarching things, in fact, the overarching thing that kind of connects all of this together is that Victoria 3 is a little bit too samey. And by that I mean the common criticism here is that there isn't enough diversity between nations. One nation is not different enough from another. They share often the same names and interest groups. They often have very similar and linear event pathways. And Finally, there are likely oversights, or maybe not necessarily oversights, but pieces of the game, historical journal entries in particular, and I'll expand on this in a minute, that are just simply missing. The overarching criticism here is that if I play a game of Victoria 3, say like I'm doing here as Japan, and then I move across and play one as the US, maybe I bounce back to Belgium and end my grand tour in Argentina, that generally speaking, I'll be playing a very similar game no matter where I play. And I think that there is, again, some fairness to this criticism. There are some things that Victoria 3 could improve on to, to sort of negate this a little bit. But to expand on it just a little bit further, the argument here is that interest groups are too similarly aligned, that by not even changing simple things like a little bit of flair around the linguistics or the language that's used, the Victoria 3 is missing out on having some vital personality. Criticisms of missing out or a lack of personality or identity also bleed through, of course, into other metrics within the game, including maybe its populations. And then there's Another layer to it as well, and that's that layer of characters, who characters are and what they bring. Now, of course, you could argue that characters shouldn't really play a significant role in this kind of simulator. However, people are political actors, and there's therefore a pretty strong justification to at least have unique character identities and political alignments with characters like, to their credit, they already do have generals, admirals, emperors, you name it. The key people are real living and breathing characters within the game. And events can pop up, like uh, most recently I had two of them want to duel and fight each other, and I had to tell them, no, we're not doing that, which ruined a little bit of popular support with one interest group, but earned me some favor with another. Again, another credit to how all of Victoria 3 systems interrelate with one another. And I hope that the takeaway message here is not that Victoria 3 is a garbage game as I move through and continue to criticize, but rather that there is more that it can build on. 
The most significant and final thing being, of course, the AI. Most people will be playing this game in single player. I'd actually really like to open up some multiplayer lobbies at some point on stream in future. Uh, do let me know in the comments if you have a lot of experience with multiplayer. I'd be keen to hear how it performs. I can't comment on it here because I haven't. But what I can comment on is the AI in the single player. And it would be fair to say that, obviously, uh, it's always going to be incredibly challenging. In fact, I can't actually even fathom how difficult it must be to try and create a human mind that can play Victoria 3 and compete with real people and then code that into the game and have it operate in a very complicated simulation across a hundred years. I don't imagine realistically, and you know, we have to be a little bit pragmatic here, that that would ever be the case. And if you're going into any game like Victoria 3 thinking that the AI will be perfect, you probably need to settle your expectations just a tad. However, the AI in Victoria 3 absolutely needs some work. And actually, you would have seen this if you've been subscribed to the channel, shameless plug to subscribe to the channel uh, for at least a little while now, in my sponsored video, the one and only sponsored video that I had with Paradox uh, before Victoria 3 came out, I played as Brazil. And in that video, you could clearly see that I was able to romp stomp over top of that AI. Whether it was either too weak and I just happened to be in a more advantageous position, eh, probably true in some instances. Whether it made mistakes or odd errors, also true in some instances. Or finally, whether it was just bad you can be the judge of that. It's not that it ruins the game though, and I want to be really clear, at least from my perspective, it doesn't. Will you want to ramp up the difficulty to have a challenge? If you're experienced in grand strategy games, the answer is an overwhelming yes. And will that fix all of its flaws? Uh, I would wager no. However, again, it doesn't ultimately ruin the Victoria 3 experience for me. Far from it. In fact, I actually like a little bit of the chaos that it brings, providing that it keeps it measured. And in my experience, at least within the first 50 years of a game, which are the years that I've spent the most time in and the most time playing, ludicrous insane things don't happen. The world doesn't completely fall apart. The AI does a good job at tempering itself, at not just rushing in and declaring war all over the show and being ludicrously aggressive, for example. It could almost use with being a little more aggressive. Maybe. Again, I'm sure it's a very fine line. And it's not for me to say how to program an AI. But it is for me to point out that the AI does need some work. In my opinion, it does not ruin this experience. But there are absolutely some weaknesses there. There's also a common criticism that it looks like a mobile game. To that, I usually scoff and say, good luck running this on your Oppo Find 3. Moving along though, although I do think the map looks actually pretty good, and also if we're comparing it to Victoria 2, is there really even a challenge? I'm not convinced. What I am convinced on is some things that Victoria 3 could do to, to really lift its game. Uh, the first could be to expand on the interest groups. It's a wonderful system. It really is quite fun to play around with a, a numbers game, but also a people game with real interest groups. And again, like I say, characters and influence a government in a nation. I really like it. Uh, some people have pointed out that there could be others added. Here again, we could see much more unique ones depending on the country that you're playing, that flavor element that is somewhat missing in Victoria 3, and will, again, almost certainly come through in DLC, but will really be required to add more replayability to the title. I still think it's a highly replayable one. There are so many different ways that you could play it out, but we need to see more diversity between nations. And those interest groups might be a way to do that, as well as perhaps adding some more generic ones, like, I don't know, capitalists, for example. The other thing related here is more events. Again, more unique flavor to a playthrough, but also to nation states. Here we could see character-related events, where characters duel, have the chance of becoming more powerful and lifting up their interest group or potentially unaliving themselves <laughs> and falling behind. There's also, of course, the, that's kind of a national level and also international level of event. Global events feel a little few and far between for my liking, although granted, of course, 
we're only in the 1800s, so let's level our expectations a little bit. Likewise, uh, national events could also, I think, be strengthened in many nations. Those journal entries as well that provide that kind of overarching quest line for Victoria 3 that are generally based on history and allow you to sort of uh, explore greatness, expand your borders, unify peoples, whatever it may be, are missing in some instances. I've heard people, for example, talk about the German uh, unification one flat out not working. Uh, in my opinion, I think that at the very least, Russia could use with many more journal entries, although I could be a little bit biased there. And I'm sure there are a number of other instances like that. What I'm saying here is that there's absolutely more to add when it comes to flavor and historical context here within Victoria 3. Although it does, again, I reiterate, provide a wonderful historical sandbox. And actually, that brings me through nicely towards the last part of this video. What's my opinion on Victoria 3? Has it changed now that the game's fully released and I have many more hours played? Allow me to discuss briefly. My final verdict on Victoria 3 still stands. I think it is a very fun, grand strategy game where you can choose to paint the map if you want, or you can tinker with politics, diplomacy, and economics. It's a fun sandbox, and I think it will absolutely have a lot of replayability. Is it worth it for every buyer, and should they buy it now? Again, I stand by what I said in my review. If you've got a grand strategy itch to scratch, and you're looking for a game that is more modern, that looks the part and doesn't look like a classical title, or maybe it's a technical thing, it needs to run on your system or in your resolution or whatever, if you're looking for a modern iteration of the Victoria franchise, this is obviously the place to be. There is not really any other competitor at the scale outside of Paradox, even. Although, of course, there are absolutely some other great grand strategy games out there. We're currently actually quite spoiled for choice. However, the buyer that decides to watch more, listen, get a feel for Victoria 3, and maybe even hold off completely until more expansions, updates, and inevitable DLCs have come out, also probably won't be disappointed. Particularly if money is your primary consideration, you should really consider that perspective. Victoria 3 is a great game, and it's an enjoyable one. It's almost certainly more accessible than Victoria 2. In my opinion, it will almost certainly also appeal to a more modern market of grand strategy gamers, particularly those who have found fondness and favor in something like Paradox's more modern titles, particularly Crusader Kings 3, which shares a very similar feel to Victoria 3, although of course its mechanics are entirely different and on a completely different scale. And so whether you think Victoria 3 has been the target of unfair review bombs, whether it's perhaps the greatness and the mighty 12-year legacy of Victoria 2 that it finds difficult to stand up against having only just released, we need only look to Civilization 5 to Civilization 6 or other similar strategy game genre examples, to see where it's been difficult for an existing player base to transition to a newer title. Sometimes it wasn't even worthwhile for them to do that. It's clear to me that Victoria 3 has things it needs to improve on, weaknesses and frustrations that will need to be addressed. But it's also clear that this is a personally really enjoyable historical grand strategy sandbox to play around in, to build mighty campaigns, or meme a bit with a minor nation. I think Victoria 3 will have a significant development cycle ahead of it, and my prediction would be that as players adjust and it grows, so too will popular opinion of it.